We are coming here now to our third session of the day and uh, the last session before the lunch break. And we are talking here about, uh, well, partnership and the partnership potentials in the postal industry. And we all know that the UPU is uh, committed to working very closely with partners from the private sector for many years already uh, and across the UN systems alongside many different uh, stakeholders and organizations that share the same objectives of inclusive, innovative, sustainable development. And uh, as of 1st of July of this year, uh, private sector parties can join the UPU, the UPU Consultative Committee to be precise, and add their voice within the UPU system. So this is a very important step, and in this session we'll discuss with our panelists why cross-border collaboration is so important and it's growing even more to be important, how these partnerships can drive innovation for the benefit of the global postal ecosystem, and we're also going to discuss what the new consultative committee members expect from this new relationship with the UPU and its member countries, but also what the postal industry expects from this new partnership. And I will quickly introduce here our speakers. We have Santosh Gopal, he's the CEO and founder of Ship to My ID. We have Brody Buller, the CEO of Escher Group. We have Walter Trezek, the chair of the consultative committee of the UPU. And we have Alexander Swanberg, he's the program manager, resource mobilization and stakeholder engagement at the UPU. And I would like to hand over to Santosh. Please take the floor. Thank you all. Thank you all. So, my name is Santosh Gopal. I'm CEO of Ship to Maidi. And today we're going to talk about how we can help post office make $200 billion just in direct marketing. I know the topic is a little exciting, so just be a little patient. In the next seven minutes, I'll tell you exactly how we could do that part. So who do you think are the number one or top competitors for post offices? Traditionally, we would think the large shipping companies, logistic companies, global companies, or we could also think about the leading marketplaces who actually sit in the driver's seat today because they decide who is going to be the shipping partner. And we all know when Amazon announced shipping, FedEx stock got 20% on the same day, and that's a reality everywhere very soon. And I'm going to talk about a certain set of companies which are data players, and they are currently doing $1.5 trillion business. They're selling into your citizens in your country, and you don't even know about it necessarily. That's why I'm going to talk about it today. I'm talking about Google and social media channels. And today, internet ad spending is almost $600 billion dollars with 17% growth of rate, and it's even more every year. You're projecting around $800 billion of revenue and internet address from spending. Think about what will it take for us to get 25% of that business for post offices, which is almost $200 billion. So ship to mind is an integrated platform which integrates addresses, identities, and preferences. When you integrate them into one platform, you get a lot of benefits into the system. And this is where we, I mean, there are players in global identity, universal identity, but the, our approach to the problem and our IP rights makes us very different. Simple things like, how do I calculate sales tax or shipping cost if I don't have an address? How do I enable transactions without giving any PII? These are the new services and offerings which we bring to the table, which will help post offices a lot. So this will open a new stream of revenues, and for today, I'm going to just focus on talking about direct marketing and advertisement. How do data players really make money? They run campaigns for businesses, brands, through different channels. They identify the prospects and share these leads to the businesses, and for each prospect, they get money. There are certain limitations with this approach. Let me explain. If, suppose, uh, somebody has a BMW car, and they just did an oil change yesterday on the weekend. And one of the vendors gives $75% off coupon. Will you really use it? Or if one of the ladies had a haircut three days ago and somebody gives 90% off offer, will they use it? Not really, because these campaigns are effective, uh, ineffective primarily because they do not include you. Most of the data providers buy, sometimes steal, sometimes copy, sometimes pay for it, spy. They collect a lot of data about you, but you are not in that equation. So we as a company, ship to mighty start with keeping you in the center, and we will understand from you what you as a person would need 
when do you need and what you need and for what price you're willing to pay. We, when we started launching these services early in the US, we already got the Best Advertiser and Disruption Company in award. In fact, Forbes wrote about us that we're one of the only company, in fact, the only company which can do a, enable a transaction without any PII. Privacy is very, very important to this market. I'll play a quick video, short video. This will explain things better than I speak, and it'll be keeping short. Effective ways for a brand to Volume, communicate please. directly to the consumers and provide relevant information about a product and associated offers. For better results, the message needs to be very personalized, and for that, business procure data from third-party data sources. As per data collection ethics for every data collection, the consumers need to be informed, take their consent, participation should be voluntary, causes no harm, maintain confidentiality and anonymity. GDPR and other equivalent national data privacy rules are getting stringent, and violations are invoking millions of dollars in penalties. Besides data violation, the conversion ratio for such campaigns is fairly low and can be between 2 to 4% depending on the offer credibility and timing of the offer. Ship to My ID has a patented next gen digital marketing platform that integrates consumer identity, personal details, and buying preferences to provide 100% of opt in data to generate newer transactions without disclosing any PII of the customer. The brand manager starts by defining the details on the offer, the demography of the ideal buyer, sets the start date and duration of the offer, and provides a digital offer to be purchased online or deliver a sample to the buyer's home without even needing their address. Every registered and participating brand can create multiple offers. Similarly, the consumer can make requests for their desired products or offers, the time frame of when they need and at what price range they are looking for, the platform can limit the number of consumer offers to ensure they are serious and committed. Consumers can use this app to define all their relationship with brands and e-commerce of their choices. Consumers can simply start receiving offers by enabling the button or pause their offers by disabling the offer button. Enabling consumers to set their own preferences will increase campaign conversions without causing distress or privacy loss. Ship to My ID continuously tracks consumer requests and matches them with various brand offers. For every match, it generates a specific QR code, which is shared with both the brand and the consumer. A fee is charged for the business for every match, every scan, and every redemption. When the brand scans the QR code, they get the username and the demographic information of the consumer. No PII is shared. Businesses can also add Ship to My IDs, Get It, and Refer It buttons in their own ad campaigns. Consumers can simply click, provide their unique username and password, and the offer is delivered digitally, or a sample is sent to home automatically without the brand getting any PII, including addresses. The Refer It option allows consumers to send samples or offers to the relevant friends and family without ever needing their addresses. Our intent is to partner with post offices and enable every post office to run Ship to My ID instances locally. Consumers and brands will both leverage the post office to do the transactions. Key benefits for everyone. The brands can reach 100% qualified opt-in buyers, define measurable campaigns, with no worries of GDPR or similar privacy violation lifetime consumer engagement and with conversion greater than 20 to 30 percent more than traditional direct marketing. Consumers can try various products, get the best deal with 100 percent control over who can send offers to them, with no risk of privacy loss. The post office can make a transaction fee for every digital offer, plus have the first right of refusal to ship products to consumers. On an average, post office can generate 30 to 50 dollars per citizen per year, Post offices can strengthen relationship between various businesses, brands, and e-commerce companies. Ship to My ID can enable post offices to be the digital hub and be the custodian for all consumers' data. Thank you. As in fact, Anisha mentioned that today being inclusive is very important. Today, as post office to survive and grow, you have to build relationship with your consumers. You have to bring all the businesses and brands to work with you. Unless you show some value which others don't, you'll be, it's just a matter of time when the business will be taken away. For us, we will want to work with post offices as a white label services 
we will bring our apps through their mobile apps. I'm glad that Paul mentioned that 43% companies already have apps, and at least we can start with some of them. And our intention is basically, we want post office with a one-stop provider for all services, for relationship brands, the, uh, all, the, all the marketing in that country. Every view, every click, post office could generate. And consumers will get the best deals, and the brands would always want to engage with you through post office, because they get 100% confirmed, inform validated information, and lifetime engagement to the, with the consumer. So to make all these things happen, what are the three things required? Post office is already bring to the table in terms of ability to deliver in every location in that country. The relationship with consumers, they do provide deliveries to almost every citizen of the world. We as a company bring our technology and our IP rights and also allow consumers to have 100% privacy control. Together, we believe we could do a lot more than what we could do on our own. Take an example of Airbnb, Hilton, Marriott, and Hyatt were competing with the space, but Airbnb came with the consumer data. So this is the process by which they won the game today. Their valuation is putting put together all the three giants, their valuation is still higher than them. So same way, post office will, will win the battle, especially the digital battle, only when they include the consumers and the businesses onto their platform. And that's our attempt. Thank you. I would now like to give the floor to Brody, please. Good morning. Um, do I need to just click through? or <laughs> Some, Somehow my presentation will show up. Uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Um, this is a, uh, exciting to finally be back in person. So I'm excited to show you some of the research that we've been doing in the industry. What we're going to walk through is uh, what we call the future of post research. We've been doing this research now for the last, uh, I think it's five years. And I'm going to show you some of the findings. We'll compare some from previous years and talk about the trends that we're seeing that get to kind of why we think it's so important that there's more partnership within the industry. Um, and the screen up here is going to turn itself off in, thir in 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you see here the contrast of profitability and revenue from emerging or in COVID versus emerging from COVID. And one of the things that you clearly see are things are better now than they were, or better, they were better at the end of last year than they were through COVID. One of the things that we're finding is that they're worse now. And volumes are down globally with postal organizations somewhere between 5 and 15%. We've seen this everywhere that we've looked. Some of that's a rebound uh, from, uh, from COVID era uh, transactions, and some of that is just volume that's getting lost to competitors. As they're moving faster in this space, then postal organizations tend to move. Again, a reason for partnership. When we ask the question of um, where you'll be seeing the uh, challenges, what you see here is that all the challenges really center on the delivery network. You have to go all the way to the, the fourth one to find one that is retail focused. As the growth in volume has created a significant challenge for delivery. That's changing then the role that the posts play. And one of the things that it has been interesting to watch is last year we reached that tipping point that we've been waiting for for a while where mo there's more parcel volume than mail volume. What that means is that organizations that historically were mail delivery organizations are now parcel delivery organizations. And the competitive landscapes could not be more different. Mail is a relatively non-competitive, slow-moving industry and there isn't a faster, more competitive industry in the world right now than the parcel industry. And that has fundamentally changed the role that the posts have got to play and the, the uh, way that they've got to play that role within the industry. A little bit more about that landscape and how it's changing. You see that the vertical integration of the, of the marketplaces are starting to get to the scale that we see of the large global integrators. Everybody is getting in this game. There was an article a couple weeks ago about American Eagle starting their own delivery company. American Eagle has no business in this business. Um, but they know that the delivery 
of the parcel, their e-commerce growth is founded on a good parcel delivery experience, and so they feel like they've got to take control for costs and speed and quality uh, reasons. The consumer has also adapted throughout the pandemic, and we're, one of the things that we're seeing is speed has become more important post-pandemic than it was pre-pandemic. The other thing that we're seeing is the change in the sorts of things that they care most about, moving off of this um, price and quality and into, some, uh, into other areas like sustainability and trust. And then finally, you see the remarkable growth in returns. This is the fastest growing space in this segment, and it's one that Pulse organizations should absolutely dominate. No one can do a return for a lower cost and a better customer experience than a Pulse organization, and it's an area that we're seeing uh, far less attention than should be paid. So why then all this focus on delivery? We talked about this a little bit, but to go, to go back on, uh, on this concept, delivery matters to every, every metric that a retailer cares about. If they can get a fast, free delivery, they're going to change fundamentally the, the interaction with the consumer. Basket size grows, frequency increases, total lifetime value increases. They come back and they buy more is the simple way to think of it. And so when you look at somebody like American Eagle getting into the delivery business, they're doing so because it changes their top line and bottom line growth. Fundamentally, it makes them a different sort of brand with the consumers, which is why, again, back to that concept of partnership, there has to be more partnership within this industry and greater change. Here you see a QR code that you can get the, the full report. If you're interested, it'll give you, take you to a site that'll allow you to type in your email address and, and you'll get the, the report emailed to you. I want to end with this thought. Right? You think about the things that we talked about there, of the changing consumer, um, of the changing landscape, of the, uh, of the changes in the market that are occurring. Trends are blowing in postal organizations' favor. As inventory moves more local, as consumers want a, a, an in and out experience. But that will only last so long. Remarkable amounts of capital are flowing into this sector that will offer the sorts of solutions that consumers want if we can't. And so, while this is the best time in the world to be a postal organization, because of the way that the trends are moving, this is also the most dangerous. Because if we don't move faster and adapt to commercial models that are out there being propagated by a lot of venture capital flowing into this sector, then what you'll see is that market shift that we're seeing begin this year, right, 5 to 15% down, will continue. And we could see ourselves in a situation of statutory decline in parcels because the market has gone around us. This is the time to act and to act quickly. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Brody. Our next speaker is Walter. Please. Thank you. Um, thank you um, for having me. Um, dear family, uh, UPU, uh, dear members, dear future members, um, this is the chairman of the consultative committee, but um, I'm also on, on the ticket of, of e-commerce Europe. So um, some, some good news, some good news. So um, after the restrictions, the COVID restrictions uh, were lifted, then uh, B2C supplies, what we call e-commerce, was going back to the growth rate. Yeah, so the market is growing significantly. Uh, latest figures also coming from one of our members, IMAC, uh, show that uh, they were presented last week in Chicago. So, so thanks to that. So, so these, these figures are stable. Um, we are talking about uh, a sustainable growth market. Um, there is a lot of bad news, however, um, especially for uh, the union. 90% of all e-commerce deliverables are made by 10% of courier express and parcel delivery operators. This is very significant. Um, 
and those 10%, um, some of them, the top 10 um, in those 10% are Chinese companies. China currently has 52% of all global e-commerce in their networks, um, with a stable volume of more than 100 billion parcels only in China. This is significant. The next one, uh, more than 75% of retail items are managed by interconnected transcontinental supply chain infrastructure. So if you're not in there, you're out. Data. What we call, and the UPU has uh, um, uh, a very good initiative here called um, Electronic Advanced Data. We are directly involved in that already with the UPU. So these uh, interconnected transcontinental supply chain infrastructures are currently linked already to existing consultative committee members. World Free Zone Organization, GS1, uh, non-governmental associations he here representing 30% of global trade, um, more than um, about 85% of all traceability of um, supply chain. Tracked volumes in the end-to-end -end Universal Postal Union network have fallen by more than 50% on the global level and by 75% into the European Union. Union. This is dramatic. The majority of B2C supplies are delivered using harmonized electronic advanced data. The UPU is a global champion in that. The, everybody else, the European Union, Americas, China, Asia, are following suit. We are setting the standards, and I mean the UPU. Pre-lodging of electronic documents uh, at item level, forward uh, harmonization uh, on trade and transport modes, DDU, DDP, is decided currently still by the UPU, but we need to be active in this field. Sustainability, CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, um, the measurements, the accounting, the reporting, um, there are clear three global standards on that. Um, harmonized and driven by UPU members, and there's a global platform on that called OSCA, financed uh, by uh, the um, member states um, of the Union. And finally, yes, minus 7%, minus 5% already in Q2 uh, in Austria and Germany, um, in parcel volumes give a clear picture. To underline that again, this is the famous graph on what's going on in the tracked volumes in the UPU network. You just saw September here, well, uh, we lost another 400,000. Um, the latest figures are early October. Um, this is very bad. Now, why then that? Why are the wider postal sector players actually interested in the union? Well, because they have all the other volume in their networks. 100% of all the postal volume, the parcel volumes, the express volumes, is in the network of the wider postal sector players, linked to us, the designated operators, and the UPU. Why they are interested in, um, in, in the union? Yeah, because of this. The UPU opened up the consultative committee. It is possible for those private operators to join the UPU. They want to be stakeholders in the network because the UPU is the champion in deciding these standards. Nobody else can facilitate that. And, and we didn't talk about that today, the UPU has the only international network backbone, IT backbone, highly trusted and signed by all the governments for exchange of data. Fantastic. Nobody else can provide that. Amazon can provide that. Google can't provide that. Nobody can provide it. No, 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 no. The UPU can provide it. That's the reason why they are coming. They are coming uh, because we also have an internal structure now established. Since last week, since the last management committee of the um, consultative committee, that structure has been installed and is now active. The thematic chapters. What is that? Well, this is UPU talk, but it basically means um, uh, that there is a clear structure now to intervene to develop, to revise global standards being decided predominantly um, in the past by designated operators. 
Well, now we are raising our hand and saying, well, we are the wider sector players. This is also our business. We want to participate. We want to participate and to put that structure into place. There have been elections, and there are now the rapporteurs, we call them. The rapporteurs will produce a neutral opinion of the wider sector players and engage in the standing groups, expert teams, expert groups of the UPU to shape the future of the markets and bringing all their expertise of that 100% of the market to the UPU and engage and bring forward possible decisions to the POC and CA. It's not done by the consultative committee, it's jointly by everybody to the benefit of the UPU and to the benefit of the designated operators. Thank you. Alexander, please. Thank you. Uh, is this working fine? Yeah, yeah. I guess. Okay, good. So thank you very much, Walter, for um, warming up the audience. <laughs> the consultative committee is indeed uh, a very interesting uh, uh, animal inside the Universal Postal Union. You did uh, actually mention some UPU jargon that maybe not everybody understands, PUC and CA. I don't know if you're all familiar with that, but uh, those are the main and driving um, main organs of the Universal Postal Union. It stands for Postal Operations Councils, which is the council where the designated operators meet, and then the Council of Administration, which is the space where all the governments are meeting um, the ministries in charge of post. So, um, in this space of the consultative committee, uh, I am, by the way, the secretary of the consultative committee, so I work in a, uh, quite frequently with Walter, and I spend more time with him than with my own family these days. Uh, but um, partnerships uh, is one of the key uh, uh, building blocks of what we are trying to achieve. On one hand, I also deal with... Uh, donor relations and resource mobilization, uh, reach out, uh, I'm reaching out to institutional donors uh, such as the World Bank, uh, the regional development banks. We speak, of course, with uh, Bill, Milli uh, Bill uh, and the Melinda Gates Foundation. We speak with uh, Visa, MasterCard, and recently we also signed a very interesting agreement with WHO. And uh, having signed that, uh, we were very surprised to see that they actually started to contact us because a lot of companies uh, from the private sector are interested in working with WHO. But WHO comes to its own limits and limitations when a, two of the biggest um, uh, reading glass manufacturers in the world reach out to WHO and say, we have a social corporate responsibility on our agenda. Uh, we would like to sponsor you, WHO, with the reading glasses. You know, how can we do? And then one of my colleagues here uh, from uh, the, the UPU gets a phone call from WHO and says, Alex, um, we have to have a meeting because WHO doesn't know how to distribute the, 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 the glasses, the reading glasses. So suddenly we get all these interesting phone calls and uh, they, they want to use uh, the, the distribution network of the UPU. So yet another partnership and this goes on and on. So the private sector inside the UPU is growing uh, by the day and next to me here uh, I'm sure that we will be able to discuss after this meeting because we count on your support so that we can help you uh, in all your projects worldwide. We are at the stage right now where partnerships inside the UPU through institutional donors and also private sector companies joining the UPU Consultative Committee is, is creating some interesting chemistry inside this organization. Allow me to remind you that we're one of the oldest organizations out there. Founded in 1874, of course we became a, a UN specialized agency only after the Second World War, but still, um, there are interesting things happening in the industry, but also inside the UPU. You've heard the speakers from the UPU today, and um, we think that we have managed to connect not only the dots with our members, the designated operators, the postal operators, but we're also connecting the dots with private sector companies that finally get a forum to get their voice heard. 
And I'm very convinced that the approach we're taking today is actually going to create a, a, a very interesting future for the postal industry because where else in the world would you have such a betrusted custodian of big data, of um, other uh, standards that we will come up with? It's the UPU. And as uh, Walter said, it's not Google, it's not Amazon, although we like them very much and we are expecting them to join us very soon. Uh, we are going to play a key role in the future of this industry. So I'm actually going to stop before my time here because I know mm -hmm. we have some, uh, we took some a few minutes uh, too many earlier. But basically, I'm, I'm here together with Walter and we're looking forward to meeting uh, up with you later on during the day and tomorrow so we can discuss uh, this future further together. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, Alexander. <clears throat> I mean, Santosh, Brody, you just joined the consultative committee. No? They didn't yet. Not yet. Yeah, but you're in the process. We are in the yet, process. So. <laughs> Santosh, you just joined the yes. consultative committee. Brody, you are in the process joining. of joining. <laughs> what are your expectations? I mean, you must have expectations. You put money at the table. You said you put resources in the game to say, OK, we participate in this process. You must have some expectations. What are your expectations from joining, really, the UPU body, if you want, and, uh, and become an active player in it? What is the reason behind it? Please, Santa. I mean, uh, Walter and Alex already mentioned that you guys will be the largest custodian of all the data. And today, data is what is, makes money for everybody. And our, what, I mean, our expectations with UPU was for two folds. One, how do we ad identify some of the unique problems and how can we solve them? And how can we take it to masses, to multiple post offices? So one is, finding the right opportunity, engaging with UPU and post offices through you guys. And once it's successful, how do I take it to 50, 100 other post offices? So we think UPU is one way to scale. And we also talked about a universal network or standardization and working with the thematic chapters. That's where we could influence some of those things where if it's successful in one of the areas, how do we replicate in other areas? Brody. Yeah, Escher is a postal um, supplier uh, right down to its core, right, uh, for the last 32 years. Um, and there never has been an opportunity to be on the inside working with the operators like there is now. So uh, because, because we are a postal supplier, and that's really all we do, um, being a part of this uh, a part of this organization allows us to to understand better the needs of the of the ecosystem and then design our solutions that better meet those needs and that's good for the operators and that's good for us so it's a win-win and the other seen from the other angle um, UPU side I mean you you bring now the private sector players on board so there must also be ex expectations that, that you have. So it's not just, I think, that you can provide services to them. Maybe you get something in return, right? Absolutely. Uh, <coughs> I, think, um, I think the biggest, the biggest benefit uh, for the Universal Postal Union is uh, the much better insight in what's currently happening in the markets. I mean, Santosh, Brody, they come with all their expertise, their interaction with national designated operators with the whole wider sector market. And, um, and this is priceless. This is priceless. Um, and that's the reason why we installed these, these vertical chapters, as we call them, because that interaction is directly needed in those standing committees, standing working groups, which ha have um, to decide the way forward. They need to uh, revisit, they need to develop the next stage of the development. Um, and the 27th um, Congress made it very clear, a digital postal sector. Yeah? So we are not talking about the uh, designated operators postal union. We are actually talking about the universal postal union. Yeah? Because we understand that all these stakeholders, two are here, Others are sitting down here in, in the plenary. Uh, they need to be incorporated. They, they need to be the partners. 
to be successful and regain as much, with the European perspective, as much as some of those already, hopefully not already, lost 75% of the volume back into the network. That's our task. Mm -hmm. Alexander, you also want to comment? Oh, just a few words to say that uh, uh, what the um, consultative committee members of the UPU can expect uh, from us is two things in a nutshell. Uh, one is, of course, to be able, as Walter said, to contribute to the, to the work of the Universal Sur uh, Postal Union. And when we are speaking about the thematic chapters, those are the mirror of uh, the work that is being done in the Postal Operations Council and in the Council administration. So we are perfectly aligned. We have found the good space to be able to reassure the people who are working in the POC and the, in the CA uh, so that we contribute on a structured way, in a transparent manner, and as effectively as possible. What they also can expect is, of course, they are here for business. I mean, let's not, you know, we have to be honest and transparent. Coming to the UPU is going to be an opportunity for business as well. Why? Because the consultative committee has started to organize, for gold members, of course, uh, the possibility of matchmaking. I'm not talking Tinder here, trust me. Uh, I'm talking uh, matchmaking to make it possible for the CC members to actually meet up. It's like a menu. You go to the restaurant, I would like to meet with USPS. I would like to meet with Kazakhstan Post. I would like to meet with China Post. We will make that happen. We will make that possible in a very smooth way, not by giving the contact details to all the new CC members that come in, because it's going to be chaos, but we are going to organize this in a very professional manner with no guarantee of results, because we're not going to force anyone to meet somebody that they don't want to meet, right? But we're going to make this opportunity happen. Uh, so this is what they can expect uh, in terms of contributing to the work of the union and also the business side of it, and many, many other things to come, but you will find that out later. Mm -hmm. Question, please. Uh, the microphone comes, arrives. Thank you. Yes, actually, I was waiting for this session so much, I uh, was looking <laughs> forward, because I come from the private sector and I'm uh, the owner and founder of the Ukrainian-based company, uh, and uh, we are an uh, international uh, parcel uh, operator company. And uh, despite of the war, we didn't stop working and we continue sending parcels to Ukraine. It's very important now, and um, uh, we actually uh, we're thinking about the international organization that can hear about us and uh, we can sometimes protect uh, our rights because, uh, of course, government has much more privileges than the private sector. Or uh, we can find uh, some uh, partners, uh, we can also work in, uh, with them. Uh, so it's uh, really, really good news about this uh, committee and uh, I would like to join so much in our company. <laughs> You, you have the form? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have it. I have it with me. Yeah, yeah. always. <laughs> Thank um, you very much. Perhaps, yep, please. perhaps um, um, one observation there. You wouldn't be the first. Yeah. Yeah? So, um, uh, this is not a secret. Um, there, there are uh, two alternative uh, postal networks, delivery networks in Germany, who already joined. Yeah? Um, there is um, a, a quite prominent uh, um, parcel delivery company, which is actually owned by a designated operator, which is a private parcel delivery company, and that joined as well. Uh, they would have other resources, we thought, but they, they wanted to be um, transparent. That's the DPD. Um, and there are others in the pipeline already. Um, so you wouldn't be the first. Uh, so we already know how to support you. Um, and what's necessary from the UPU regulation environment to actually support you um, and help you to interconnect possibly with other designated operators globally. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think that, uh, government also you still have the mic? Or? Yeah. Uh, I think that government 
government also driven by the success of the private sector. So maybe they will coordinate later much more with uh, also your uh, union. That's one of our tasks. Um, okay. One of uh, the biggest tasks of the consultative committee and especially the management of the consultative committee is to take away the fear of designated operators that our members might steal their business. None of the members who came to the consultative committee and were accepted and authorized by member countries had the purpose to steal away business from designated operators. Their main focus currently seems to be to complement the business of designated operators, also in Africa, also in Asia, also in Europe, yeah, and therefore could contribute to the business of designated operators. That's very important, yeah? and that's one of our focuses, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe because the microphone didn't work, I mean, <clears throat> what the, the comment was here also, or the question, um, in, in the direction of becoming a member of the consultative committee, which would also strengthen the position of the company in the respective country towards the government, because it's simply more officialized. Let's put it this way. Please, uh, Elma. Uh, uh, Elma Toime. Um, two questions. First question, on your behalf, how much will it cost for her company to join uh, your setup? Yep. Uh, the second question concerns cross-border, mm -hmm. where part of the trends that you've shown here is that individual parcel shipments are being replaced by freight shipments, so that the international parcel has now become a domestic parcel delivery. Mm -hmm. What's the relevance of the UPU in that move? Yeah. Um, for how much does it cost for um, a company to interconnect uh, to that global postal network? That would be a gold membership, and it would be 20,000 Swiss francs annually. Okay. Yeah? Um, if, um, if that's too much, and we have reasons uh, uh, to support uh, that, that will go through the um, CA, the Council of Administrations, yeah? and there is a possibility um, to look into that fee. Yeah, but that's not on the topic of the consultative committee. It would then come out of the budget of the UPU. Yeah? So that's the first answer. And the second answer is um, there is also um, there are certain working streams uh, within the UPU, in particular in the transport um, and, um, and logistics standing group, um, on looking into this famous B2B2C channel. Another one is, of course, and I can't avoid that, standardization. Um, um, there is um, a, uh, a barcode that can be used um, within the uh, UPU standards, which allows to um, put a barcode, uh, not the S10, but the S26 barcode, onto a parcel under bilateral agreements, which allows delivery through direct induction of a private postal operator in the delivery country. Yeah, imagine that. Yeah, the UPU has a standard for this. Yeah, this, is, this is great news. One of the reasons the DPD is joined. Okay, thank you very much. Please, right behind. Yes, Thomas. Well, Thomas Rogendorf, Seapost International. And I guess it's for Brody, but maybe for everybody. It's a very interesting um, slide you showed where the the parcels are declining. And talking in different settings with each other, this is not a surprise to us. International clients, for years, we're already complaining about the self-declared rates, the VAT in Europe, the direct uh, vertical integration of the, the Chinese companies. Uh, but do you think now, looking forward, that is we going bare, we're going to a more normal situation? We had years of dramatic growth of parcels, which theoretically shouldn't be coming from China which we're now taking out, and we're settling? Or do you see a much wor worrisome trend where besides the mail volume, we're also going to lose the parcel volumes? Uh, and how do you see in that the trend we're seeing now of returns? Because if the parcels are declining, what is going to happen eventually then with the, re with the returns? So how, how do you see that in the future? Because I think that's really a, a canary in the mining. It's a, it's a dangerous uh, uh, field we're going into. So there's three elements there. Cross-border, uh, trends we're seeing there, and uh, Elmar touched on this, because of the disruption in the supply chain, we saw a lot more freight forwarding staging in the, in the country. 
And my expectation is that will continue, right? The, the, the um, structures have been put in place to maintain that and, and the, the challenges with clearing cross-border with the new regulations that are coming in, I, I think just exasperate that. Um, when you look at domestic volumes, the key will be the ability of the postal operators to, to pivot into more local solutions. We're seeing less end-to-end -end and a lot more um, local-to-local as companies through with the pandemic had to rework their supply chains to push inventory closer to the edge using stores. They've unified their, their inventory management systems now. And so expect to see that trend continue. And as you take advantage of the local, I think we'll see volume growth come back uh, uh, on the domestic. Um, and then the, the third is um, kind of what we're seeing in, in the mail space. And I don't expect that to, to, to change. I think we'll continue to see structural decline and kind of whatever you were pre-pandemic, you're probably there uh, again. Two more questions, one here and one here. <laughs> I'll be very brief because I'm asking for the second time, but I have a question for Alexander and Walter because we discussed a lot. Uh, uh, to remind the audience for the third pillar of arbitrage and postal strategy is uh, UPU is a prime knowledge center with focused analysis and a uh, lot of trainings uh, possible to, to everyone in the world. Are you planning to attract somehow the um, university, scientific institution, consulting companies deal with the postal services to be a part of consulting com companies to create some kind of uh, board of knowledge uh, from private sector to support uh, UPU ideas to become a private uh, primary knowledge center because we have a very good example from ITU. ITU Academia is established 25 months years ago and the results are quite magnificent. So I think that not only to focus to the, to the operators and supporting industries. We need a lot of knowledge from outside in, in UPU. What do you think about this? Maybe one word and I give the floor to Walter. Um, thank you for bringing the question up. It's, it's a very good question. Uh, as you know, the baby was just born 1st of July, so <laughs> we need to get walking first before we go running. Uh, but uh, of course, we, we need this uh, academia uh, inside the, the consultative committee. It will bring us uh, a certain edge that we would not necessarily get from the private sector. Uh, uh, and and uh, I think this is something that will come. Uh, and the thematic chapters, uh, they're not static. They will evolve over time to include other uh, themes as well. Uh, and we will also uh, have uh, sub-chapters that will see the day very soon. So thank you for bringing that question up, Walter. Thank you, Alexander. Um, my answer is for sure, out of a very simple reason. Um, onboarding these, these new 13, 15 new members um, over the course of the last couple of months showed that most of the time we spend in onboarding them was educating them. Yeah, they had no idea what the UPU actually can provide to them, especially when it comes to supply chain management and the IT backbone actually open to them. And that includes also those who actually should have been put onto that IT backbone already some time ago. Freight, forwarding, airlines, customs, VAT handling companies. Yeah, so there's a lot of lack out there in the market, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that quite bluntly and directly. The UPU un undersold itself for decades. The UPU is hugely, a huge body, and, and, and we are usually saying that the PTC is actually a huge bar of gold, and nobody knows what the UPU actually got. It's fantastic, and that's the reason why these companies are coming. They are coming saying, look, we can offer these services. We want certification. We want certification that we are compliant to the UPU standards. We want to put our services right on top of this IT backbone. Like, like mobile applications, you have a global infrastructure like mobile applications, um, and, and we would like to put it right onto these mobiles now. Services on top. And, and they will be possible. 
Yeah? Um, not now, but we are working on that. Thank you. A last question, please. No, here in the front, in the front. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, and uh, <laughs> yeah, right. yes, um, I'm Chief Moyo uh, from the Pan African Postal Union, uh, and I'm sure from from that uh, name you you know I I speak on behalf of uh, the African uh, member states, and. Uh, I will be failing in my responsibilities if I do not uh, air the views that I'm going to air now. Uh, the consultative committee, uh, from the way it's being presented, the way it's coming out, it looks a bit more of an exclusive club. I'm not seeing any African uh, players coming in at the moment. and. Um, if you look at the structure of the UPU, you have the POC, you have the CA, and membership there is done in such a way that there is geographic representation. And um, I would want to, we would want to see the consultative committee having this reflection as well, so that, uh, uh, like I said earlier, everyone has got uh, their role to play and we should see the private players coming in and playing their role. And um, the private players are not only from Europe, uh, private players should be from all over the world, mm -hmm. like what the Universal uh, Postal Union is, is all about. Uh, this is, by the way, a teaser to you, Chairman, to say when you reflect this uh, consultative committee uh, reflected in such a way that it becomes uh, all-embracing for all the private players. And uh, again, I become a bit uncomfortable if you speak like you are speaking for the Universal Postal Union. Uh, the consultative committee, as far as I know, does not speak for the Universal Postal Union, unless if they are speaking on the areas that they are mandated. To, to, to speak to. And why I'm saying this is because we want to be clear from the time we take off which lane uh, we are uh, uh, running on. And if it's a relay, we do not have the two team members running at the same uh, stretch. We should have one here, the other one, next point going forward so that together, the private sector, the uh, designated operators, the regulators, the government, together we can make this sector work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any, you want to react or? Yeah, yeah I please. would like to react. Mm -hmm. um, we have in the pipeline um, applicants from all continents, including Africa. Yeah, so please expect there will be private companies joining the consultative committee coming from your region quite soon. Another point is that uh, we undertook uh, a lot of effort to reach out to uh, a number of continents. Um, so I've been in Asia, I've been um, in, in the Caribbean, I've been in the US. Um, we, uh, we are uh, looking forward to have more membership coming from Asia as well. Um, uh, we, uh, we have already members coming from um, South, South America, North America, Europe. Um, but, but the membership is developing. And um, the membership will also have a clear focus on inclusion, <laughs> in particular um, when it comes to Africa. So uh, right now, I was only able to be invited by the South African Postal Union. I joined their meetings twice already, not in person, but virtually. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to be invited by you to make that case, not only to your members, but also to their wider postal sector players, of course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people who know me know that I do not fear sleeping in planes uh, to attend their meetings. Um, um, I'm just waiting for your invitation. Please reach out to me. We will do whatever we can to attract and in include, um, in particular, your continent and also offer certain services which will come through our new membership directly to Africa to boost, to boost the volumes 
from the designated operators. I hope that helps. Alexander, perhaps you want to? Yeah, just to say that, thank you, Walter, uh, that we will use the existing UPU structure through the restricted unions uh, all over the world to go out there and championship uh, to have regional uh, balance in the membership of the consultative committee. Um, the days have 24 hours, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, we, we will do it. And I'm ready to take on a bet that before uh, the end of the year, we have uh, uh, five new members in the consultative committee from uh, the African region. And as a matter of fact, we are working on a project. We might see a very interesting um, pilot project coming up on the African continent, but it's top secret, so I can't say more about it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. We have to close. We have to clo really close this session. We're very late. Um, we can we can give a hand to the audience. Everybody, stay seated. Uh, you don't go away. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, to